On this edition of Geopolitics and Empire, we have a really interesting guest, Dr. Pierce Robinson. He is the co-director of the Organization for Propaganda Studies, former chair in politics at the University of Sheffield, and he founded the working group on Syria propaganda and media. He's been at the forefront together with other experts such as Tim Hayward and Vanessa Bealey in blowing apart the Western media narrative uh, in the war on Syria, poking holes in the White Helmets story and the corruption within the OPCW and their fabrication of chemical attacks in Syria. We'll be discussing that and the current pandemonium surrounding the coronavirus situation of which he recently wrote about and he questions whether we're witnessing another deep event such as the September 11th attacks and if Corona is the new global 9-11. So thanks for coming on, Dr. Robinson. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, I've been following you for, for years uh, and you recently wrote uh, a really good piece for Off Guardian that looks at how governments use events such as 9-11 uh, and COVID-19, what's happening now, to you know, bring about, to push forward this national security state, you know, militarize society, introduce draconian laws, install a mass total surveillance state. Uh, I'm here in Kazakhstan right now, and, you know, we're not, in a few days, we're not going to be allowed to leave the, the house, and we'll be given uh, cards that will permit us every other day to leave the house. I'm just reading in Australia now, um, they're going to fine people $11,000 or uh, jail time for leaving their house without an excuse. So this is now happening around uh, the world, especially and including in the West, not just China. And so, you know, get, getting to to your article, for many of us, the official 9/11 story doesn't add up. And you mentioned recent publications from the University of Alaska and elsewhere, which confirmed that the official U.S. government investigation was wrong, if not plain fraudulent. You write that. The 9-11 global war on terror is increasingly coming to be uh, understood across the world as a remarkable propaganda campaign designed to enable violent conflict in the international system and with its effects and objectives being far wider and deeper than had been suggested by official narratives regarding the need to combat Al-Qaeda. So then you ask, is the coronavirus a new 9-11, a new deep event? And you say that the parallels with what is happening today are obvious. And, you know, I think this is the question on all of our minds and the markers are point, pointing to this. So can you help us kind of understand what you mean by deep event and, and what is happening as you see it? Well, I mean, yeah, there are deep, deep, the idea of deep events, this was, I think, Peter Dale Scott who coined that phrase, but the idea of very significant events uh, which occur, which are then used and exploited in order to push through really fundamental long-term changes, economic, social, political, etc. cetera. Um, and I mean, obviously, I mean, the point when I wrote the article was to really raise, flag up the, the point that we know, uh, so a lot of us know a lot about 9-11 and know a lot about the questions and uncertainties. And certainly from a, a strictly academic point of view, you know, it, it's, it's an, it's an instant, it's a case, it's an event, which is very poorly understood. And at the same time, there are very powerful, legitimate questions, which some academics do look at, which raise serious questions about who was behind the event, uh, and so on. And, and those, those debates have actually been, sort of been going on for a long time, and they have actually more recently started to come to the surface a little bit more, uh, particularly with a, a big university study at the University of Alaska, which raised very serious doubts about the official investigation into uh, the collapse of WTC7 in New York, and also a range of other academics who have over the years been raising questions, etc. And, and it's very clear that that event, um, on the one hand, there's a lot of questions about the manipulation and the involvement of various groups in that event. Um, and also, perhaps more importantly than that, is, is, is the way in which that event was used politically. And in a, in a sense, whilst there is sort of this kind of emerging academic debate about what actually happened on 9-11, you know, there's a lot less dispute that this event was definitely used and exploited, uh, principally in terms of my own research area, to enable the war, the regime change conflicts, which we've seen actually now really over 20 years. 9-11 um, became a deep event which ushered in civil liberty restrictions, etc., but also a war on terror, which has 
And, and I think you know, the empirical record is pretty clear now, and pretty convincing that it was used to initiate wars, to remove countries from the international system, which were seen as challengers, uh, opponents to the United States and to the West. And so obviously, you know, this is just in the last 20 years, and these wars are still going on. We're still in, in, in the situation where the wars which flowed out of 9-11 are still in play, Syria, for example, um, and also coming wars, potentially, Iran, China, possibly, and so on. So it, when you put all of those sort of blocks into place, it becomes quite clear that sort of, you know, you've had a major in a sense, propaganda, this war on terror, this, this hysteria over Islamic fundamental, fundamentalist terrorism being used to start major wars in the international system, which are still going on and which might get worse at some point. Um, you have that kind of exploitation and propaganda going on in relation to that. The, the obvious question when you have this incredible event with the corona virus suddenly breaking out into, into the newspapers and mobilizing governments around the world in the same way that 9-11 mobilized governments, okay, particularly in the West. Um, you know, the, the really important thing, questions to ask is that how is this event going to be exploited? Is it going to become a deep state, uh, so a, a deep event which is exploited by countries in order to pursue particular objectives? And, of course, the great danger we have is that, and I remember, I'll, I'll sort of finish on this train in a second, uh, when 9-11 occurred, very few people in the West could really say anything. Everyone was caught in the headlight, headlights, and the war in Afghanistan very quickly initiated, and then the regime change wars started to flow after that. There was no, there's very little resistance, because people were terrified. Okay, terrified by the threat of terrorism. We know that that threat is, was, was, was overblown at the very least, and also obviously serious questions about who was actually involved with 9-11 and so on. And in, in, when you have those climates of fear, which is what we have now, um, the danger for exploitation is, is absolutely huge. Um, and it, it's, it's critical at this point that people start to think on that level. If we're all going to be caught in the headlines having a blind panic about viruses, etc., um, then we're in a very, very dangerous position. And I think we are in a very dangerous position. And every day that passes uh, reinforces to me, and the more information I get from, from my work and what other people are passing to me, uh, says the same thing, that we should be very, very concerned about what's going on, that there is uh, every sign that this, will, this is going to be a, a deep uh, event, and it's going to be used, it might be used to take us to war. It might be used for fundamental restructuring of the economy and so on, a whole host of things, most of them linked, I think, to the attempts by Western governments, Western elites, establishment to maintain their power in the international system. But I think those threats are very, very real. And, and they certainly, uh, in my opinion, they transcend the immediate threats of a virus, which is a low lethality virus. It is. We, we know that categories of people that it's most dangerous for, but, it, but at the moment there's, there's no indication that it's uh, significantly different from what we see with major flu outbreaks every year across the West. It's quite amazing what's happening, I have to admit. But, I mean, all the alarm bells are ringing on this, I would say, um, that this is, uh, we're in great danger of very dark deeds being enacted uh, in the coming months and years off the back of, of the coronavirus crisis. Before taking a look at some of these uh, potential dark deeds, you mentioned uh, the fear and hysteria, which you know we saw with 9-11, uh, and, and we're seeing again now this fear and hysteria with uh, the virus. And I think maybe uh, right now, maybe a few more people are, are questioning what's going on than they were during 9-11, but it still seems to me that you know, 99% of the people that I know around me have been taken in uh, by this fear and hysteria of, of the virus. And I think most people don't have a really good understanding of history, political science, and you know, the reality of uh, deep events. And they've suffered from years of institutional propaganda and, and brainwashing, and they don't question anything uh, they're being told. Uh, we see government, media, uh, institutions, and scientists uh, lie. And, you know, if you could tell us uh, a little bit about what you're seeing now with this propaganda aspect and the narrative control on COVID, because as you said, there are many real experts and scientists who are questioning the official mortality rate and, and 
um, other things. So, I mean, what's your take on, because we're like witnessing 9-11 again, and we're in real time, you can kind of look at uh, the propaganda that's happening. So what's your thought there? Well, I mean, we certainly, there, there certainly seems to be questioning going on. Um, I mean, I think everyone's caught in this situation at the moment. Um, th th there are signs that there are some serious questions being asked. You know, in, in the UK context, you had uh, Lord Suntian uh, raising these issues and Peter Hitchens, and, and you've seen some other journalists in the UK mainstream media raising uh, questions about civil liberties, raising questions about the context for the death figures which are being given. Um, and saying, well, there's no context for these. This, is, this doesn't really help people understand how serious this is. Um, so I think that there is some question, but, but it, it's coming up against a really very thoroughgoing, uh, what I've described as, as sort of propagandistic information, which is pouring through the mainstream media. I mean, I think there's a lot of, as has been pointed out by other people, there's been a lot of fear-mongering, a lot of the coverage of uh, this issue, and certainly some of the mainstream coverage which I've taken the time to look at, you know, you'd be forgiven for thinking that we were dealing with something that was similar to the bubonic plague from, from the 16th, 17th century. The, the kind of understanding that's being communicated is, is one that simply generates hysteria, or generates, um, if not hysteria, at least people have great difficulty thinking rationally about, well, it, are, are these measures the government is putting in place, are they appropriate? Um, you know, what, what is the risk of, 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 in a sense, making the situation far worse through sort of economic crisis and so on? People are having great difficulty, I think, thinking straight uh, with the, the, the mass of, I mean, yeah, the kind of reaction you're getting from the mainstream media. Um, I think there's, there's something to keep in mind is if, if terrorism and the fear of terrorism is a powerful, as it were, propaganda tool, potentially, making people fearful of, in the case of 9-11, fearful of, of, of Muslim fundamentalist terrorists, I mean, the potential is something like a, the virus or a virus propaganda tool, if, if it's being used for those purposes, is that this, this is, is all-encompassing. People are made scared of everybody else. Everybody is scared of everybody because of the virus. And, and of course, it taps into these sort of, you know, culturally, this deep-rooted fear of, of contagion and disease and, and so on, which, you know, we, we grow up with, the stories and history and so on. People are easily terrified. And I think in this situation, the propaganda is, you know, it, it, it's, it's acutely powerful in the sense that people, you know, are obsessively looking at the death tolls going up and up without any context being given for those death tolls. And as some people have pointed out, well, this, this, this looks like, uh, you know, comparable to a couple of years ago when we had a big flu outbreak and so on. There's very little proportion um, in, in the way it's being discussed, certainly in the mainstream media. And, and, and that is fueling this kind of, this, this almost this juggernaut, or this, this propaganda juggernaut at the moment. And it's very difficult for people to raise questions. Although, as you said, there are people raising questions. And, uh, and I, I have some hope that certainly in, in the UK context, possibly the European context, is that there will start to be a rational debate over uh, the response that there should be to this virus and a, a careful check on power and what governments might be doing. Um, I think it's going to be a bit of a battle to achieve that, but I do think there's hope for doing that. There does seem to be some movement and some doubt. Um, and and I, would, I would say that you know, everything we, we have that we can pull together in terms of, of the lethality and, and the dangers of this virus, I mean, there is so much hype around it. There's so much fear that people think this is almost as bad as a bubonic plague, when in reality it's not, that this, this could be a propaganda bubble, bubble which is very fragile, which could burst. You know, when people sit back and think, well, is it really the case that... Um, you know, some of the, the worst case scenario death tolls will actually be realized. And that's not the case um, that people start to think and they see people saying, well, look, this is not entirely different from a year ago when we had the flu outbreak and there are better ways of trying to manage this problem other than clamping down in the way that they are on civil liberties. Um, you know, there's, there's potential for all of that, I think, to, for, for a more 
intelligent discussion to occur, but I think it's going to be a battle to get that, but it's essential to get that. Otherwise, we, we, we just run the risk of what we had after 9-11. We, we, we just ran headlong into war after war after war, which carry on until this day, which caused huge amounts of destruction. And also loss of civil liberties, you know, the Patriot Act, the, the acceptance of bulk surveillance, uh, by intelligence services. This is, this is totally incompatible with democracy. <laughs> you can't have a democracy where people know that they're being monitored potentially by the, the, this, uh, intelligence services, and yet 9-11 was used to bring that in. So, um, so I, anyway, I, 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 think, I think there's some debate, and, and, and people who, who do understand what's going on need to push very hard at this point in time to you know, talk sense, um, and to try to get people to think rationally and, and to hold their governments to account. Okay, um, and I'm you, fingers crossed on that. <laughs> and and um, so, uh, you know, in a way, as you mentioned, uh, coronavirus has become the new Osama bin Laden and um, Al Qaeda, and it gives kind of governments carte blanche now to to do what they want. And it, uh, as Peter Hitchens and Lord Assumption have have wrote. Um, in a way, people are voluntarily being duped into giving up their freedoms. And it's a classical historical example of how democracies turn into dictatorships. And so there's this question, you know, which should we fear more, COVID-19 or what I like to call COVID-1984, right? Um, you, you mentioned mass surveillance. So now it seems uh, what's already being implemented, laws are being passed in countries around the world, uh, you know, Israel, passed this law that gives them now the ability to surveil every Israeli citizen's uh, mobile phone. That same law then uh, was passed in one of my countries. I'm also a Croatian citizen. Croatia just passed that same law that was passed in Israel to give the government full access to our um, mobile devices to spy on us. And so, um, you know, how far can things go? You know, we had the Patriot Act, um, you know, as a U.S. citizen now, because of the Patriot Act and the National Defense Authorization Act, I can be, uh, you know, on my next trip to the U.S., I can be apprehended by authorities and they can say, you know, we think you're a terrorist, but we don't have any evidence, but we can keep you uh, in prison indefinitely. And so that's where we were with 9-11. And so how far from what you're seeing uh, can things go now? Um, I, I think at the moment... Uh, I, I think things things are getting close to as bad as they could possibly be. Um, I think that, I mean, as, as I said in the article, you know, it might be the case that this this virus is is as serious as some have suggested, and that, that the uh, lockdown is necessary, and it will bring it to an end, and then everything will go back to normal. You know, that might well happen, and I'll be relieved if that's the case. Um, but it doesn't really look like that to me. I think that the losses of civil liberties and freedoms, which are uh, being justified because of the virus, some of that will be clawed back when the emergency stage is lifted, but not all of it. But this will be used to essentially to, 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 to further close down democracy um, in, in, in the West. Um, and so I think it's as bad as it could be. I, I think... Um, there are very worrying signs that um, in the context of a hybrid warfare against China and other competitors in the international system, that Western power blocs will use this and use this crisis to further hybrid war. Um, I suspect, or I can't be sure, I, I suspect you know, this, is, this is going on as, as we speak. Um, you know, there's... There's indications from in, in Iran, Iraq, etc., and Syria of, 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 of potential military activity. Um, there's been some, you know, uh, doubling down on the propaganda against China. This has got all the signs of of, of, of the hybrid war escalating further. Um, and I, I guess, you know, one isn't speculating saying that. Well, we've been in a war for for 20 years, some would argue much longer than that, but certainly the current phase of conflict in the national system was 9-11 tri triggered. Um, and so we've been in that state of, of, of war in many uh, theatres for 20 years. And so why is that suddenly going to come to an end now? There's no reason to think that it will. I think um, in broader geopolitical terms, you know, the, the West and America is in a position where it's weakening in the international system. 
um, and competitors such as China are, are rising up. And as, as I'm sure you know, as many real theorists would point out, that when you, when you have those transitions in the balance of power, you know, they're often accompanied by conflict, sometimes major conflict. And I think that's what we're seeing and that's what we're observing. Um, it's difficult to be absolutely sure because obviously we see lots of governments reacting to corona in, in, in particular ways, but I, I'm sort of in a sense more concerned about what our, how our governments in the West are reacting to it and what they might be using it for. And it's undoubtedly the case that we know the West has been pushing a belligerent warfare strategy for 20 years, as <laughs> clear as, clear as, um, as, as they, um, that that's been going on. So th there is no reason to think that's going to stop. It's probably going to be um, extended now. Um, and we have to be very worried about that, just as much as we have to be worried about whatever kind of restructuring of the economy that they might try and push through uh, under the cover of corona. Um, that's not so much my area of expertise, but warm conflict is, and, and, I, and I'm very concerned about that. This is um, a very worrying moment, I think, um, and I don't know where it's going to go. But what I do know, it's, it's more likely to go to bad places if everyone is, is so panicked by coronavirus that they don't have time to look um, at what's going on. So You mentioned the China, and it was startling to a few days ago to read um, now in, in the Western military publications, you know, you have a uh, former, uh, I, I read an article um, about the dragon. Uh, I can't remember the title, but basically about China now thinking about attacking uh, the U S uh, in the Pacific or elsewhere, you know, launching a direct attack against the U S. So the fact that uh, some in the West are already discussing military conflict with, with China. So we're starting to, see these articles pop up and i mean do you think it's a realistic uh, scenario going forward as you said why will they stop this military expansion now we have this, the thucydides trap where you know we're kind of in this formula that kind of plays itself out unfortunately um is it realistic that we might see china and the u.s you know go from hybrid to real military conflict in your mind well, in a way i i i i, I suspect that, that it's i mean hybrid warfare is real military war, I, I think. Um, you know, if you look at the conflict that's occurred in Syria and, you know, the army of proxy groups and so on, and the kind of activities that you saw throughout the noughties before uh, the war really started in a big way in 2011, you know, all of these tactics which are used to try and weaken and break society, sanctions, for example, it's all part of hybrid warfare. I mean, this is war, this is it's not sort of tanks and aircraft and so on. So I don't think we should ever downplay the, you know, how important hybrid warfare is and how destructive potentially. Um, I think in this context, I, I think there is a possibility of, of, of all-out military conflict, but I think that's less likely. I think it's going to be a hybrid warfare intensification of that. Um, now, I think, I mean, it's difficult. I mean, uh, whether the, could the West seriously win a military engagement with China? Probably not. So that's why hybrid warfare is more likely. The problem is, you know, if the West goes down that road, we just have this intensification of what we've had with the regime change wars following 9-11. We have this intensification and more and more pressure being brought to bear. Then at what point does it actually trigger a military response from China? I mean, who knows? This is, this is what I've been saying for many years. We're at a point of transition in the balance of power in the international system, and we can either try and manage that peacefully and in a way which deals with the big problems facing humankind and which also encourages dialogue between states, or we can just go through this transition having one huge uh, struggle and fight um, and at the moment, we're going for the struggle and fight approach, which is potentially terribly destructive and terribly worrying. So I, I think, I, you know, I think it's more likely a hybrid warfare. This is what we're seeing is intensification of that, um, as opposed to all-out uh, military conflict. Um, for, principally, because I don't think you know the West and the Western military planners probably know that they can't win that kind of war. Um, so, you know, th these kind of strategies of destabilization, sanctions, exploitation of the corona virus panic, you know, in putting doubling down the pressure on Iran and on Syria, countries which are sort of, in a sense, more exposed to a health crisis, um, however severe that health crisis it actually is, is kind of besides the point, um, you know, but it can be used as an opportunity to double down on countries. And 
I mean, I think uh, Aaron Maté and Max uh, Blumenthal were, and Grayson were reporting on on Venezuela and uh, South America and so on, and the U.S. government um, orientating itself or doubling down on those countries, get, forming some alliance with Brazil. This is just in the last 24 hours. Um, so I think that's the kind of thing that we've got to be very, very wary of and try to keep our eye on um, as the corona issue um, sort of rolls on. I guess my, one of my last questions on the Corona 9-11 before we just uh, ask you about Syria and the OPCW is, you know, we're thinking a little bit outside the box. You know, we had evidence going back looking at 9-11 that, you know, there was foreknowledge of 9-11. We had um, insider training uh, before the events and, and, you know, the Project for a New American Century report from 2000 that called for a, a new Pearl Harbor and, and things like this. Um, and I mean, this, uh, we're just probing here, you know, uh, do you think that um, regarding the coronavirus, you know, we had the events 201 in October uh, of 2019, where they ran a war game on the coronavirus pandemic. And then a few months later, it actually happens. What are your thoughts there? Well, I mean, on, on the issue of 9-11, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that it's, you know, the, the, the question from a kind of a mainstream academic point of view is, what was the level of state involvement and which states were involved in it? And I, and I think that's, a perfect, that's, a, that's pretty obvious now um, that the official story is incorrect. Now the question is who was involved in it and who was involved in influencing, arranging, etc., and from which states, okay, um, including from within the U.S. political system. Um, and, you know, if, if, it, if that's the case with 9-11, then it's perfectly possible that, you know, there, there are actors at play in relation to this. I mean, some people have talked about bioweapons and so on. All, all of that is possible. Um, you know, I mean, after 9-11, you had the anthrax scares, of course, which Graham McQueen wrote about or researched and wrote about. The anthrax scares at the time, they always presented, well, this is some kind of Al-Qaeda, Islamic fundamentalist terrorism. As it transpired, the anthrax came from a U.S. laboratory and it was released by a U.S. scientist who, I think, committed suicide prior to his trial. Um, and so this issue of bioweapons and, and so on, yeah, that's something which needs to be considered um, in all of this. There are so many, there are so many, so many sort of uh, things that everyone's balls, people got to keep their eye on in all of this. But um, uh, it's not an unreasonable question. And it's not an unreasonable question to think through the possibility of, of any number of actors being nefariously involved in this, you know, beyond sort of the idea of government's going to exploit this, it, it, it's possible that it would be, um, I mean, this is one of the, the sad you know, realities, I think, when the OPCW is formed, you know, and the Chemical Weapons Convention, you know, that you haven't got something really equivalent for biological weapons, or and then the US has, has, has been building facilities and so on. Um, I, I, I think, you know, this is, this is one of the things which we need to keep our eye on through all of this. Um, the fact that, especially if we're in a hybrid warfare situation, you know, are, are there actors who might be sort of using technologies in order to, um, you know, create modify viruses and so on and use them in a strategic way? Um, it's, it's a possibility. Um, I wouldn't rule it out, um, especially given the concerns that we now have in relation to 9-11. Um, we live in a world where people do dark deeds. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in fact, on this podcast, uh, on January 29th, uh, we were the first to conduct uh, the interview with the bioweapon expert, uh, Francis Boyle, who wrote the Biological Weapons Convention in 1989, who came out saying he thinks, you know, Corona, COVID is a bioweapon. And, you know, then our interview went out to, to spur countless other interviews but uh, YouTube deleted. We had over 300,000 views on YouTube alone of that interview. And, and a week ago, YouTube uh, deleted it. And so I've got people emailing me, where can I find that interview? And it's been reposted. So yeah, it's kind of questionable, you know, why do they delete this information if, uh, if it's, you know, just conspiracy theory? And just uh, on that final, I wanted to ask, you know, how do you deal with walking that line between be being seen as a credible academic and the attempts to discredit you by calling you you know, a conspiracy theorist for just asking legitimate questions? Well, well look, uh, 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 these days, anybody who asks serious probing questions of, of, of the power structures that they live within are called conspiracy theorists. Everyone. I mean, you know, so even if it's the mildest conspiracies, for example, British government involvement in torture of some uh, 
Libyan dissident. I remember Jack Straw saying, oh, that's just conspiracy theory until it was, you know, proven. <laughs> you know, so anyone questioning power gets, you, that label is used against them. Um, I, I, I tend to, in terms of walking the line, I, I think you just have to uh, try to remain objective and balanced. Um, and if people want to call you names, then they can call you names. You just, you just have to ignore it. Um, some people do buy into that and don't really understand that uh, the term conspiracy theorist doesn't actually make an awful lot of sense in, in the sense it's intended to mean that, you know, it's just crazy ideas, whereas, in fact, you know, conspiracies obviously happen. It's a legal term. <laughs> we put people, we send people to jail for <laughs> conspiring, etc. cetera. Um, so you just have to battle through that. But my, my feeling is in the, in the West that there are a lot of people who are aware of these problems and there are a lot of people who are aware that there is a lot of corruption in the West and political corruption um, and that, uh, you know, we need people to be speaking out about it. Um, and, and don't get, they're, they're not swayed by the conspiracy uh, um, theorist smear. Um, and, and I see, you know, you see it time and time again, whether it's Peter Hitchens or it's anybody else who questions power. I mean, Bob Parry from Consortium, set up Consortium News, you know, he, he was involved with um, revealing the Iran Contra scandal. They're all called conspiracy theorists. It's just, um, I, I think it doesn't have the currency that it used to. Um, um, and, but also I think if you're in this situation in the world that we're living in today, especially in the West, um, if you're not being attacked, then you're probably not doing your job. Um, and it's, you know, this is, this is in a sense, this is kind of the price you have to pay for speaking truth in an environment where there's a lot of corruption, you'll get abused and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know, these things are becoming very obvious, I think, to a lot of people. Um, so, you know, I don't worry too much about it. Um, you just have to, um, brush it off and so on. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've had that same approach and, you know, conspiracy theory, the term, and it's kind of like what you said, you know, I'm not conspiracy theorizing. Uh, I did an interview with my students when I was an adjunct professor, uh, at, at, when I started this podcast with Lance DeHaven Smith, who's a professor emeritus, uh, who wrote the book explaining, you know, using declassified documents, how the CIA basically uh, and the mainstream media in the 1960s and 70s popularized this term conspiracy theory uh, as a weapon to discredit um, critics. And so, again, that's, my approach is very academic. I did an interview with the expert who explains the origins of, of this term conspiracy theory. So if you have any final thoughts there, uh, and then we can move on to... Um, you telling us what's happening with the OPCW and the war in Syria, because, you know, I think it's now four whistleblowers who have uh, come out from the OPCW. And basically, it's kind of, I guess, been discredited as a neutral institution. Um, so, you know, what's happening there? Well, obviously, so everyone's being knocked a bit sideways by the corona issue and also of course and thinking about broad, more broadly what that might mean but but before this kicked off the, the OPCW issue had reached a point where um, that there were at least four um, effectively whistleblowers two further statements or emails were, were published um, which showed that there was concern dissent within the organization um, but more importantly you know as of January February you know, it was January when Ian Henderson addressed the UN Security Council at the Uriah formula meeting and what was um, so he communicated his criticisms of the OPCW investigation of the alleged chemical attack in Duma and Syria in 2018 but of course we've had this massive leaks going on for many months um, and certainly from our work looking at this as academics um, and the working group um, you know we, we have enough information now to uh, piece together exactly what happened and, and exactly what happened with the Duma investigation was that uh, the, the Duma team deployed they came back they wrote an interim report um, they were very skeptical that there'd been any attack at all um, that was in their report, that was then redacted without their knowledge, and then there was an argument. And then really all the, all the OPCW inspectors who went to Duma were sort of really muscled out, forced out of the investigation process, and they handed it to somebody else, and then produced a final report, which is demonstrably fraudulent. So the final OPCW report, it obfuscated the advice from four NATO toxicologists saying that the people had not been killed from chlorine, 
okay, it obf obfuscated that. And of course, as we know, it, it famously, they, they blocked the inclusion of Ian Henderson's engineering report, um, which said that the cylinders were probably, probably hand-placed. And so, you know, we, we have all this, this mass of evidence now, which is sitting there. Um, we're involved in further work, which will pull together material, which I can't talk about at the moment. But um, I, I think at the moment, because the, the final OPCW report is clearly fraudulent uh, in scientific terms, and there are these two issues over the toxicology and the ballistics, um, I think the, the efforts now are focused on, on getting some proper scientific review of the toxicology and the ballistics, and, and that should probably seal it. Um, that you can prove beyond any reasonable doubt that um, an attack didn't happen, that the OBCW report was fraudulent. Um, so that's, that's where we are. But as I say, it's all displaced somewhat by, um, for everyone, everyone's been displaced by corona. But that, that works ongoing. But of course, what, where it will take us to, I think ultimately, certainly in terms of our own research and writing up, is that you have, a, you have as you've had with 9-11 and the war on terror, and as you had with Iraq and WMD, and as is possibly the case with exploitation of corona, um, you, you have a lot of propaganda and distortion of reality for political purposes. And, and I think that the big story on Syria and alleged chemical weapons attacks will be, will be like an Iraq 2.0. Um, but also a very serious one because and it does link into what we were talking about before. It, it, the concern here is especially the OPCW being able to be used and manipulated in order to create fraudulent reports, essentially. Um, it becomes a trigger mechanism for war. It becomes a trigger mechanism for war against Iran or Russia, for example. Um, so it's very, it's very important. It's very dangerous. And it's part of, I think, this broader problem that we have of, of the Western Empire, um, the way it has um, got itself uh, able to manipulate international organizations which should be independent and has become a tool for war, in a sense, a wars which, which the West have been driving for, for a long time. Uh, that, that's the big story from it. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I'd say I mean, we have the briefing note which the working group published recently. Um, Paul McKee gave a talk at the Harvard Sussex program on chemical and biological weapons. Uh, we gave a talk at the House of Commons, uh, uh, House of Commons meeting. Um, I, I think the evidence is, is pretty much home and dry now as to uh, what happened. And, and it was a manipulation. It was a deception that was going on in relation to Duma. Um, and that points, I think, to a broader deception in the case of Syria. Um, so that's where we are with it. Um, we'll certainly keep pushing that forward in the context of all of this um, chaos we seem to have going on around us. Because, um, you know, life, even if corona is a real thing, which has to be managed, you know, life is carrying on in, in, in other realms and so on. So we'll keep pushing forward with that. But um, um, so that's where we are with it. And I think the OPCW, um, you know, what happened with that, the, the fabrication of this chemical false flag attack. I mean, it's a perfect example for, for Corona, again, because we had uh, in this war in Syria, war on Syria, I guess, this independent institution, a credible, you know, authority, international institution, national governments um, lie to us. And the same is happening now with, with Corona. If they did it with OPCW uh, and in Syria and, and the media as well, they lied to us. You know, what are they not telling us about now or, or what, what are they fabricating now with the coronavirus? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, a lot can be learned. For anyone who's, who's sort of thinking about corona, sort of go and read the material that my working group has put out and other people have put out, journalists such as Peter Hitchens, uh, Aaron Mate, and Max Blumenthal Grayson have been publishing some of the leaks and WikiLeaks as well, and use that to understand how organizations which should be independent can become manipulated, how scientists can be suppressed and manipulated. And, you know, the more we understand about that, the more equipped we are to not necessarily distrust everything we're told, but it's, it gives us the tools to actually uh, evaluate more carefully and more fully what we're being told, not to be dangerously trusting 
of organizations and of power. You know, was, this is why we brought in, this is why democracy evolved, is because you, know, you, can't, you cannot trust power and organizations and, and democracy is all about people getting equipped with knowledge and then challenging and scrutinizing their governments, defending their freedoms, the basic principle in, in democracy. And, and in short, that the whole OPCW saga can tell you a lot about manipulation and propaganda and deception. Um, and and it's, it's, it's a good learning process, I think, and people can apply it and use, equip themselves with that knowledge um, and to think more carefully about what they're being told. As Iraq, WMD and 9-11 are all other, you know, key examples from the recent contemporary history where people, if they read and understand and, 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 and absorb the material, it gives them, uh, in a sense, better capability, sort of intellectual self-defense against um, propaganda and deception and manipulation. Because, um, boy, are we at risk of that at the moment with this this fear of, of, of the virus gripping so many minds. Very malleable public. Um, I used that phrase in, in the article. I wasn't able to dig out that, what, I was, what I was thinking of, but that was, uh, I think, a press briefer for the Bush administration after 9-11, talking about this is a very malleable moment. This is a teachable moment for the American public and so on. Um, and that was at the time. So, you know, we, we want to be, we do not want to be malleable. <laughs> we want to be uh, challenged, uh, we're being told. Again, not to misbelieve everything, more important than it's ever, ever been. And it's a critical moment for the West, I believe. It's a critical moment for the history of West and democracy and for the West. Uh, so I think there's a struggle ahead, but... <clears throat> and my, my so final... Keeping forward. Mm -hmm. And I guess my final question then, if, if, if there's uh, anything else that I haven't asked on Corona, 9-11 or, or Syria that, that you think is important to bring up or your final thoughts to, to leave us with as, as we all witness, live in real time, the, you know, the global 9-11, the coronavirus edition, um, any final thoughts for us? Well, it, it, it's very important that people um, support each other in this situation. And it's very important that people who do have some knowledge and some awareness, um, you know, work to both speak out and challenge and to think through what's happening. So, people have to try to stay, if they can, unified. And certainly people who have raised critical questions need to support each other. Um, but it's very important that that happens, you know, for, for a long time and throughout most of my professional career, you know, we've been involved in wars and I've gone through the academy and I've seen time after time a real failure of academics, for example, to really question what's going on and to stand up, even when terrible things happen, even on torture and so on. And, you know, I, I think for people who sort of intellectual leaders or academics, you know, there is a real responsibility now to uh, be informed and to stay, if, if you doubt what's going on, to stand up and, and, and be counted in terms of challenging what's going on. I, I think people, people do have power. I think people around the world have power, um, but it's very important that people um, use their own intelligence, use their own intuition, get informed, read around, and then, and then act and then stand up if necessary and say, well, I don't agree with that. Um, you know, whether that's in personal, you know, discussing with family or whether it's if they're in a different setting and they can challenge what's going on. Um, that kind of willingness to um, not simply be led is, is very important at this, at this point in time because we are in, I think, I think we are in a very, and I, uh, I'm generally a very cautious person and so on. I, I think we're in a, it's in, a, in a deeply worrying situation now. And, it's, and and people really do need to um, get informed and to speak up and to use their own intellect. Um, it's we we could be going into very very dark times if that doesn't occur. So now it's, it's now or never, <laughs> I guess. Um, and so on. And, you know, people such as yourself and you know others. There's lots of people doing this. Um, so um, <clears throat> yeah, and that. Mm -hmm. Try to move move forward with this, or however dark it gets. <clears throat> yeah, and I, I I agree with you. You know, I think it's this is uh, I think what we're witnessing happens once in a century. You know, this is like you know World War One, World War Two uh, yeah. era. What's happening, and it's uh, frightening. And 
I also think more people need to to speak up and, and to to stand up regardless uh, of the consequences. That that's what we need. We yeah. need this critical mass and uh, you know people speaking out and stop being uh, afraid because in the end, you know who who knows how far this can go. Um, and and I know uh, I'll post all of your links. You're on Twitter. You're on Facebook. Uh, you have a few websites, um, which it's it's a great resource. A great um, information so is there anywhere you'd like to mention um anything else to mention like uh people where, where people can follow you your, your work um we'll put those links up i mean i i think that on my my wordpress site um which is uh, uh, on the first page it does have the, the the working group links as well so you might put those up anyway but there's the syria working group there's the war on terror working group now um, and then the organization for propaganda studies um, that those are and then twitter and facebook um, those, those are all on that page but yeah th- those are the main ones um, for, for people to, to look at if, if they want to follow up on some of this um, yeah Okay, and you know, Dr. Robertson, um, uh, Robinson, uh, thanks for your brave work. Uh, we hope you keep doing what you're doing. Uh, you also, you know, inspire other people to to do uh, to follow your lead. You know, questioning the the status quo, and these are truly historic times. So, again, thanks for the interview. Well, thanks very much, and you keep up the good work as well. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast and interview. I would like to remind you that our website is geopoliticsandempire.com and you can sign up for our mailing list that goes out each weekend with the latest podcast and a long collection of important news headlines. It's good to sign up for the newsletter in case we experience censorship and deplatforming. You can help the Geopolitics and Empire podcast by subscribing to and interacting with all of our channels such as YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Gab, Minds, and Steemit. You can also help us by leaving a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform such as iTunes, CastBox, Stitcher, Spreaker, and so on. Finally, if you value our work and our mission and would like to see us continue interviewing experts from across the political spectrum, please consider leaving a one-time donation via PayPal or Bitcoin or becoming a regular monthly supporter on our Patreon. All the links can be found on geopoliticsandempire.com. Thanks for listening.